thank you. Welcome to the public hearing on S-169. Can folks hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, closer? I know who I am, okay, great. Okay, hopefully this is better? Great, so welcome. I'm Representative Maxine Grad of Moortown, and I chair the House Judiciary Committee, and I'm joined here by uh, most of my committee members and uh, also by staff. I want to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I want to set some ground rules for the chamber for this hearing. I want to remind folks that this is not a play or a uh, spectator sport, but it is a public hearing. So the ground rules are there are no signs, no banners, no props, no outbursts, no applause. I ask that you refrain from displays of preference while people are speaking. or at any time. Each witness has two minutes, and I will ask you to stop when your two minutes are up. Uh, the, are we going with the lights? Yeah, the, so the yellow light um, means that you have 30 seconds left. I ask that everyone in the chamber is respectful, and if folks choose not to follow the rules, I will stop the hearing, and I will wait. And unfortunately, that will probably prevent people who agree with you from testifying. And uh, we will stop at 7, as posted. And uh, we are going to flip a coin uh, to see who goes first. I'm going to ask my Vice Chair, Representative Burdett. Uh, heads will be pro S-169, and tails will be against. As it is. Okay, so, and Representative Burdett will be calling the names. Thank you. We're going to be calling three names to, to start. And uh, the first name that I call, come and sit in the chair. Uh, the other two uh, names, you can either sit in one of the chairs over on the side or on the sofa. And after uh, the first person testifies, I will be calling one name at a time. And, and come down to the, to the front here and uh, just take a seat. And we're going to start with, with Rob Black, Richard Lee, and Alyssa Black. had the text messages of the last 36 to 40 hours of Andrew's life analyzed and learned that Andrew had an acute adjustment reaction. Again, that's an acute adjustment reaction. Minutes before Andrew took his life, he sent a text message that said, I did something today that I shouldn't have done, but it's too late now. It was too late for Andrew at 1126 when he walked out of the gun shop with a firearm he had just purchased. He said so himself. I did something today that I shouldn't have done, but it's too late now. Andrew needed a little more time. A short waiting period would have, would have given him that time. So I urge you to give the next Andrew Black a little bit of time they need to wake up the next day and say, what was I thinking? I can't tell you how many, but I can tell you this law will save lives. I respectfully ask that you move this bill forward and give the next person in the middle of an acute adjustment reaction the little bit of time they need, the time that will make the difference between life and death. Next to testify is Richard Lee, and could 
Emma Bauer, come down to the front. I want to thank you for allowing me to address this infringement on our rights. In a conversation with Mr. Baruth a year ago in Montpelier regarding violating gun rights of Vermonters, I asked why he refused to respond to the many emails I had sent. He responded, I don't care how many emails you send, you will never change my mind. I do not care what side of the aisle you represent. It is important that you don't infringe on the rights of lawful people to support a bought and paid for agenda. That is why you take an oath. Money received to promote an agenda and emotions should never be the driving factors for passing laws. I really want to thank those of you that take your oath seriously, brushing partisanship aside and continually fighting to preserve our rights. You are truly appreciated. I don't know of anyone more concerned with violence than the gun owners in the state of Vermont. What are the true causes of gun violence that have come to bear after a record of safety for over 200 years. We have a crisis with drugs being served up in our schools and our streets. We know for fact that these drugs cause mental issues. We are all concerned. Many of us took a course about suicide prevention and learned that unless you are in the right place at the right time, there is nothing that can be done to prevent it. Will you really try to convince me if one method of suicide is taken away, another won't be used? No one here is capable of playing God. Who knows the number of deaths from drug overdoses that are suicides? Can you answer that honestly? Mr. Baruth thinks this law will prevent suicides. Facts prove him wrong. It is common sense to honor your oath and vote no to this law and any laws that infringe on our rights. Thank you for allowing me to speak. And I would like to pass this on. Thank you. And can we have uh, Marie Leota come down front? And next to testify will be Alyssa Black. Thank you. We're going to hear all sorts of arguments against this bill tonight. All the incorrect assumptions about suicide. They may even get up here and offer their feigned empathy and then list all their relatives and their friends who have also killed themselves. And then they'll dismiss any evidence that could possibly challenge their absolute belief that any gun law is an infringement. They'll speak about how safe Vermont is and in the same breath how they need instantaneous access to firearms to protect themselves and their families. Protect themselves from what? I can assure you, the danger is not out there. Statistically, it's inside the park. It's the son who had a bad breakup or failed a class. It's your favorite uncle who lost a job. It's your best friend whose wife just left him. I only ask that you listen to facts, real research, and truth. My husband and I made a conscious decision to open up our life for all the world to see. And we've been subjected to disgusting insults, horrible accusations, and even veiled threats from people who haven't the foggiest idea of who we are or who Andrew Black was. We aren't doing this for Andrew. Andrew's dead. Andrew made a horrible, impulsive decision, and our family has to live with that for the rest of our lives. We're doing this because we know that if this law is passed, there are families that will come home from work to an intact life, and they'll never realize how perilous, perilously close they came to standing outside in the freezing cold at the bottom of their street while a policeman says to them, you need to prepare yourself. We found a deceased male in an upstairs bedroom. And their beautiful, intact life crumbles in an instant. That's who we're doing this for. We know it will make a difference. Thank you. Can we have Daniel Monger come down? And next to testify will be Marie Leoga. Marie Leona from Eastfield, Vermont. 
A gun in the hand is worth more than the entire police force on the phone. If a man has to wait 24 hours to commit suicide by gun, he very well may decide to use his car and take out five Harvard students instead. That's five innocent lies versus his one. He may decide to hang himself in his home for his family to find, or he may leave his car or truck running in the garage. He may jump off of a building or commit Harry Carey. Any one of these options are not necessarily a win in my opinion, but suicide is a symptom of an illness, as is the problem with every school shooter that has killed in gun-free zones. Those people were cowards with even bigger issues. 24 hours accomplishes nothing except make a law-abiding citizen who pays his taxes and votes and tra to travel to and fro two times to his destination to accomplish his one goal, to purchase a handgun. The only one winning here is the anti-self-defense mindset that guns are the problem, not the people. This is an untrue allegation without regard for the woman in need of defense. I was once that woman, a single mother. A criminal says, I don't buy guns at stores, and I don't care about your stupid gun laws. Background checks won't stop me. Keep focusing on the good people. That's exactly what I want. Thank you for hearing me. Can Grace Walter come down? And next to testify is Emma Bauer. Good evening. My name is Emma Bauer. I am a 19 year old resident of Stratford, Vermont, a first year student at UVM, and the director of Vermont Youth for Gun Sense, a, stru a student gun violence prevention organization here in Vermont. I'm here as a representative of these students to express my support for a strong bill that mandates a waiting period of at least 72 hours for all gun purchases. Thank you for providing me and other students with an opportunity to speak. There are multiple ways in which gun violence harms children in Vermont, and more must be done to make sure that children are, are protected from this public health epidemic. First, Vermont has the highest rate of youth suicide in New, in New England. We must address the presence of firearms in relation to youth suicide. An adequate waiting period requirement is beneficial for it provides a young Vermonter qualified to purchase a gun with a cooling off period to reconsider what is often an impulse decision. We strongly support a lengthening of the waiting period to 72 hours to strengthen its effects. Additionally, we strongly support expanding the waiting period to all gun purchases, as a report from VPR demonstrated that approximately one-third of deaths by suicide using a firearm between 2011 and 2017 in Vermont involved long guns, both shotguns and rifles. Lastly, it must be said that the risk of suicide for Vermont's youth is increased by the presence of firearms in the household that have not been properly stored and are still accessible to the children in the household. Second, domestic violence is present in many of Vermont households, which impacts both the partners of perpetrators of domestic violence, as well as any children that may be present in the household. We support waiting periods as an effective method of preventing fatalities as adult and child victims of domestic violence leave an abusive situation, for it is in those critical days that the majority of domestic violence homicides take place. For these reasons, we strongly support an adequate waiting period for all firearm purchases, and we hope that the House will pursue these and other measures that will put the safety of Vermont's youth first. Thank you. Can uh, Justin Lindholm come down and next to testify is Daniel Monger. My name is Dr. Daniel J. Monger and I live with my wife Kathleen in New Haven, Vermont. Approximately 14 months ago, the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting provided the impetus for the anti-gun debate to start the 2018 legislative session off in crisis mode. Rahm Emanuel said it best with his Alinsky eye quote, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. With Senate Bill 55, the argument last year was that the draconian measures would help keep us all safe in the lives of Jack Sawyer. This was Governor Phil Scott's cathartic justification to reverse his longtime promise to protect Vermont gun rights. But this legislation was ineffective, and why? Because today, Jack Sawyer can still come and go as he pleases. Last year's circus revolved around Michael Bloomberg, 
Senator Sears, Bill S-221, and Representative Maxine Grads, Bill H-422. The obvious resolution for these uh, domestic violence bills was to protect threatened individuals and provide them professional self-defense firearm training. Remember, when seconds matter, the police are minutes away. But instead, the crime is to confiscate firearms without due process. So today's circus revolves around the imposition of a 24-hour waiting period to purchase a handgun. The premise is that this restriction will save more lives from suicide than would be lost if an ex-husband or lover were able to follow through on his threat to kill his estranged wife, all while she waits 24 hours to obtain a firearm for protection. Every life is sacred, and the life of one threatened with violence is equal to the life of one who is contemplating suicide. And lastly, may I suggest that, and I know everyone in this room would agree, that there be a prerequisite requirement that before any lawmaker can take their seat in Congress, each must pass the mandatory college course of logic. <laughs> Now, Martin, can you come down and take a seat? And next to testify is Grace Walter. Hi, my name is Grace Walter. I'm a sophomore at UVM, and I originally come from Newtown, Connecticut. My town was devastated by gun violence in 2012 when a man opened fire in Sandy Hook Elementary School. I'm affected by this to this day and will carry that grief with me for the rest of my life. Too many times life has been taken by a gun while precautionary measures were not implemented. And too many times as a parent, sibling, relative, friend, and community member had to grieve the life that was taken. I, as a youth and patron of gun violence, am asking for public policy to reflect the dangerous epidemic of all types of gun violence. Vermont youth suicide is among the highest in the country. It is imperative that we recognize that 24 hours is not enough time between a background check and having a gun. Adding an additional 24 hours to what already is being offered could save a life of a youth contemplating inflicting harm on himself or on others. In a state like Vermont who prides themselves on the safety of their residents, having all guns covered in a law that speaks to suicide pre prevention is imperative. The world, youth, the world the youth want to see is one where lawmakers are courageous and care about the issue of waiting periods so that we can feel safer in our everyday lives and we no longer have to grieve people lost by gun violence. Thank you. Next, can Martin Van Buren Jr. come down and testify is Justin Lindholm. I'm Justin Lindholm from Menden, Vermont, and I have a little bit of expertise here. I actually uh, watched as a person killed himself with a firearm and from here to that podium right there. I also have been in the sporting goods business where I had uh, bought and sold guns for many, many years before I retired. And I also carry a suicide hotline number of my own because I have um, bouts of uh, depression every two or four weeks for one minute at a time. Now, what I would like to see would be if somebody comes to trade a gun at a gun shop, he should be allowed to leave with that gun on the spot. A dealer can easily tell whether a gun is capable of firing or not but is being traded in as he knows the one that he's selling also can be. And also, if a person was just to bring in his personal firearm and just to show the gun dealer, I already have one, may I leave with that gun now? That should be allowed. Uh, these things are very common sense and they're very important. I think one of our big problems we have in this state is bullying in schools. Rutland Harold had a horrible article on it last week. I was bullied as a kid a lot in Vermont school systems. When I left the Vermont school systems to go to another state, there was no bullying. We need to learn how to do that in Vermont. We've never learned it. That will stop some suicides when it did. Also, our laws on um, defense of, of people who really are horrible people. I had to hold off a person two years ago with my personal firearms. He had already been convicted of 14 felonies in the state of Vermont. 
and he was only a little over 50 years old. I had to defend myself against him as he came at me three times with a club. That should never be allowed that a person could be walking the streets after 15 felony convictions, which is where he's at right now. Thank you. Um, next, come down, uh, take a seat, Bob Williamson. And testifying is Mel Martin. My name is Mel Martin. I'm a second generation Vermonter, born and raised in Springfield. I grew up around guns. My father and two uncles were police officers. I was a police chief for 31 years. I hunted as a teenager and into my late 20s. And until four years ago, was a gun owner. I'm here to urge you to support a minimum 72-hour waiting period for all gun sales. As lawmakers, it is you who have the responsibility to pass meaningful public health policy. And a 72-hour waiting period in all gun sales clearly meets that standard. The argument that waiting periods impede self-defense is baseless and illogical. If I or anyone felt seriously threatened by another person, the idea of buying a gun for protection is contrary to common sense and only increases the chance of gun violence. Call the police. Considering safe storage, consider this. A 32 caliber rifle was stolen from my home in 2010. It was not secured. It was never recovered. There is no logic or basis for excluding long guns from waiting periods. Long guns are consistently used in suicides. I have never, ever admitted following to anyone, including my wife. Once during a personal crisis as a much younger adult, I felt so helpless that I wanted to end my life. It was going to be with a shotgun. Unlike so many, I'm here to talk about it. Thank you. Can Robert Atkinson come down and take a seat? And next to testify is Martin Van Buren, Jr. Hi, my name is Martin Van Buren, Jr., and I'm the owner and manager of Mark's Sporting Goods in Poland. I'm here to testify against the firearm waiting period, S-169, and in support of the section of the bill that relieves restrictions on the firearm magazine possession of yours. I have owned and run my business for 40 years. I am an FFL federally licensed gun dealer. I have bought and sold firearms for the entire time I've had my business. Any person purchasing a firearm through an FFL like my business will go through a free sale a federal NICS background check. A person who is prohibited from possessing a firearm by the federal law will be denied. I am opposed to the waiting period, for I do not believe it will prevent the use of a firearm for the use and a person taking their own life or committing a crime. A person who is so committed to taking their own life that they would consider using a firearm will simply find other means. In fact, the purposes of this bill were to prevent suicides. More attention should be directed to that purpose, purpose, and there should be no waiting period for a person if the FFL and a documented history of previous firearm sales. I have on record for decades back a federal form 4473 required in all sales to citizen, a person to take their own life. Convicted felons, violent criminals, acquire firearms through illegal means or by having someone with a clean criminal record make the purchase of an FFL for them. FFLs are not required to make a sale if they believe if there is anything amiss with the person seeking to purchase that firearm. The FBI stats prove that Vermont is continuously one of the very lowest violent crime rate states in the nation. The 2017 FBI crime stats, the latest available show that, once again, Vermont has the second lowest violent crime rate in the nation. Maine is lowest, New Hampshire is third lowest in the country. VATF, VATF data shows that Vermont is not a major source of guns for other states. Thanks to our excellent firearms training and Vermont Fish and Wildlife Hunter Education Program, our state has a high safety record for firearm ownership. And I am a firearms instructor. I've been for many years. The action of a few should not be punished by all. I say that the action of a few should not punish all of us. Thank you. 
motion. Iris, I, I think it's Slam. Come down and take a seat. And next to testify is Bob Williamson. Thank you very much. Uh, reasonable Vermonters agree we need a waiting period for buying a gun. I applaud the Senate for its vote on S-169 and Senator Sears for brokering a compromise. That said, I strongly, strongly believe the bill would provide more vital protection from suicide if it required safe storage, included all firearms, and a 72-hour waiting period. Keep in mind, on March the 19th, the New Hampshire House passed a seven-day waiting period. This is personal. I grew up with guns. I had a bolt-action 22 rifle and loved target shooting. My dad had a semi-automatic 22 rifle and a 38 pistol, and my brother was a collector. 52 years ago, my uncle took his life with a handgun. His death left a wound in our family. My cousin Nick first learned of his father's death when a news reporter called him to ask for a statement. Imagine the shock my cousin felt with that call. Alyssa and Rob Black lost their beloved son Andrew last December to firearm suicide. All the guns in the Black household were locked up, so Andrew needed to buy the firearm he used to take his life. Experts say that the act of carrying out a suicide is most often an impulsive decision. If you can delay that action, impose real impediments like a waiting period and secure firearms in the home, you have a real chance to help deeply depressed individuals. Consider these facts. 420 Vermonters died from firearms between 2011 and 2016, and 89% were suicides. 85% of suicide attempts with guns are fatal. Vermont's suicide death rate is 35% higher than the national average, and guns are used 59% of the time. Of the 433 firearm suicides in Vermont from 2011 to 2017, 153 were carried out with a long gun. Clearly, our waiting period should include all firearms. Please support a strong S-169. It will save lives. Thank you. Okay, next, can Marsha Thompson come down? And next to testify is Robert Atkinson. Good afternoon. I am Bob Atkinson for Wells Vermont. The proposed thrust of this legislation was preventing suicide. That appears to be untrue. This young man's loss was blamed on impulse. If the difficulty was a sudden inexplic inexplicable impulse, why did he have a 36-hour timeline? Why were the firearms in the house locked up so he did not have access to them? Something was going on previously. Nothing in this bill would have altered the end result. This legislation is not really about suicide prevention, but about gun control. If the Vermont legislators, most of whom are incumbents, wanted to stem the horror of suicide, there would not have been 5,237 patient days in 2017 spent in our state's emergency rooms by Vermonters with mental health problems because there were no beds available in mental health facilities. Why don't you fix that? No one mentions how many suicides are the result of psychiatric drugs. Just watch TV commercials to see how many list suicide as a side effect. Uh, excuse me, side effect. In the U.S., 80,233,280 Americans are taking psychiatric drugs for depression, ADHD, psychotic episodes, and anxiety. The best explanation for drug side effects came from a neurologist. Drugs play with connections in the brain, and we can never be sure of the effects because everyone's brain is not the same. These drugs have been largely developed since Prozac was released in 1987. Based on CDC data, the suicide rate per 100,000 rose 27.6% from 1999 through 2016. Could these drugs have had an effect on this rate increase? Are the pharmaceutical companies studying this? Though there are lobbyists who spent almost half a million dollars in Vermont in 2018 to learn our legislators about these drugs? If the desire to end one's life is not medically assisted, then you must face the real problem. What in their lives is so wrong that they want to give up and die? There's a short seven and a half minute video from Morning in Vermont titled Suicide and Gun Control in Vermont. That can be found on the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen Club's website. It is outstanding and includes suicide prevention tips and links. Anyone with an open mind should invest a few moments to view it. Children make decisions based on emotion. Adults make decisions on verifiable facts and reason. Please don't let your emotions cloud the decisions affecting our freedom. Thank you. Anna Nemec, come down and take a seat. And next to testify is Iris Land. My name is Iris Chung, and I'm a freshman at Essex High School. I'm here to testify in support of S-169, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to do so. 
Children in this state, in this country, are afraid. We huddle in the corners of dark rooms because we're afraid. We lock the doors and sit silently because we're afraid. Because there's a possibility that we'll go to school one day and we won't come home. The fear that our friends and family will not come home is a real one. We're trained to react to school shootings like we do to fires, as if they're an inevitable danger. But it doesn't have to be this way. Those who own guns may have the right to bear arms, but you have the right to regulate them. And I urge you to. I urge you to keep your community safe and I, by enacting S-169. Because my generation has the right to, to school, to go to school unafraid. We have the right to live, and we have the right to have a bill that not only regulates handguns, but all other guns as well. A bill that gives a three-day waiting period in order to ensure safety. Children and teens with bright futures are dying, and inaction on this matter is unacceptable. Waiting periods are going to save lives, and they should be the first step towards securing our community's safety. They are not a restriction on gun use, but rather a barrier between people who are desperate to hurt others or themselves and their means to do so. Last year, I organized the Enough National School Walkout in my school because there had been enough deaths due to gun violence. And inaction continued. The more innocent community members and children died. Waiting periods need to be enforced to ensure that impulsive actions aren't taken. Enacting this legislation is going to save lives, and hopefully this body will bring more legislation that will protect me and my peers from the gun violence that we've been raised in fear of. Please help my generation. Give us the small steps towards keeping us safe. Please free us of the fear of gun violence that we live with. Help us by passing S-169, and please continue to save lives by enacting gun control. Thank you. Bert Saldi come down, and next to testify is Marsha Thompson. First, let me introduce myself. I'm a graduate of Norwich and a 39-year retired veteran of the United States Army. As a career instructor, I was a marksmanship instructor for the last 10 years I was there. I'm an NRA certified instructor in four disciplines, a competitive NRA shooter, and founder of the Vermont Women's Shooting Association. This association was created because it came apparent that there was a great need for women wanting training to learn about guns from all points of view. We've only been around for a couple years, and last fall at our clinics, which we can only take 16 at a time for safety reasons, we were getting 800 and 1,000 hits from women wanting to come to these clinics on our Facebook page. Women who wanted to learn about guns in a safe, supportive environment. It's women training women. There are a few men involved in the background because there aren't enough women that have the expertise, but it's women training women. Gun violence is heavily intertwined with the issue of domestic violence. At least 52% of American women killed with guns are killed by intimate partners. Instead of developing more laws, it seems that the ones on the books should be enforced, such as the Lautenberg Amendment, which prohibits possession of firearms and ammunition for anyone convicted under a misdemeanor of domestic violence. 41 states do not enforce this federal law. In 35 states, these people can still buy guns. And what about the ones that they already possess that weren't taken away from them? A natural starting point for prevention of gun violence is to identify individuals who are at risk for violence and need of assistance. Many policies and practices intended to reduce harms lack evidence of efficiency and may contribute to the unintended consequences. A waiting or cooling off period could have turned into be exactly the opposite of that, and a heating up period in a domestic violence case. Rigorous scientific research must be done to support any new laws. We'll never resolve the issues till we all commit to paying special attention to what's to be need done and, and use scientific evidence to make new laws. So support the right for women to defend themselves. Thomas Eli, come down and take a seat. And next to testify is Anna Nemec. Hi, my name is Anna Nemec from Burlington. Thank you for this hearing. I speak in support of S-169. Weekly, I advocate in family court for plaintiffs who are showing great courage in seeking final relief from disorders. They often are very concerned about guns to which the defendant has access. They want the guns gone and are even concerned about access through family members. Guns have often been used to fight and control them. Often the plaintiffs have been prevented from learning how to use a gun, 
and learning how to prevent a gun from being used against them. Are there those that turn to guns for protection instead of the courts? I am sure there are, and they have the right to do so. But week after week, folks who come to Chittenden County Court are not asking for court access to guns, in, in spite of the fact that this is a dangerous time for them. Guns for them represent their abuser. In other words, I am a Vermonter. Doesn't matter how long I've lived here, but at a time we're trying to include people to come, all points of view are needed, they should be supported, our collective values, as diverse as they might be, are Vermont values. And as we go along and grow as a state, then we will have differing views and we've got to learn how to agree and disagree, and we will experience change. Through discussing our different views, new and better solutions will emerge. John Chaffee, come on down, and Bert Salvi to testify next. Bert Salvi, Barry Vermont. These proposed firearm, firearm legislation right now, future days, and years will not stop a person or persons from being involved in a, in a crime, unlawful act, nor will it stop people from doing harm or death to themselves or others, period. Trying to pass unenforceable and unaffected laws that only affect law-abiding citizens. I'm not looking at the real problem. This is the same, these are some of the things that legislation should be working on, such as uh, abuse, child abuse, substance abuse, and mental health. I do not support any new firearm legislation. Didn't you legislators pass enough last year with S-55 to, to harm the community, the firearm community? Thank you. Uh, Richard Smiles come down and Thomas Eli to testify. My name is Thomas Ely. I reside in Burlington and currently serve as Bishop of the Episcopal Church in Vermont. I'm also a member of Bishops United Against Gun Violence, a network of over 80 Episcopal bishops working as people of faith to curtail the epidemic of gun violence in the United States. Our group offers four contributions, public liturgy, spiritual support, sound teaching, and advocacy for common sense gun safety measures. It's in reference to that fourth contribution that I testify today in measured support of S-169. The work around gun safety and anti-violence that the General Assembly did last year and the work in which you are engaged this year is vital public health and safety work, and I thank you for that. Today I ask you to continue and deepen your commitment, specifically by amending S-169 to establish a 72-hour waiting period time provision for the purchase of any and all guns, not only handguns. I know that not everyone who purchases a gun intends to do violence to themselves or others, but sadly some do. Strengthening the provisions of S-169 to include a 72-hour waiting period on all gun purchases might slightly inconvenience some, and yet could well save the life of someone you or I know and love. Once a gun, any kind of gun, has been used to end one's life, inflict injury, or take the life of another, there is no waiting time left to offer, only regret and mourning time. The waiting time needs to come while there is still a chance to prevent the violence, time to reconsider, time for someone to get help, time for cooler heads to prevail, time for a thorough background check, time that can make all the difference. It is about time in more ways than one. Thank you. Edward Gilbert, Jr., come down, and John Chaffee to testify. Hello, my name is John Chaffee. I own Black Dog Guns and Shooting Supplies in Rutland, Vermont. I've been a gun shop owner for about three years, started in my house and built my business up, and I now have an 800 square foot uh, retail establishment. We are required to run federal background checks as gun shop owners to uh, pass the um, 
people come to my shop, some of them travel over an hour to purchase firearms from me because they like my selection. Uh, they might live in a very rural town and they might not have a local shop. So they drive on the weekends and they come to visit me and they like to purchase firearms and they like to take them home with them. Um, if they can't take them home with them, they might not come to my shop. They might not purchase from me. They might go to an online sale and maybe there's somebody that sells out of their house close to them and I lose that sale. All firearms, whether they're bought online or bought at, um, at a shop, have to go through a background check. They have to be shipped to a dealer to go through that background check. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people in this area that enjoy firearms and it's like buying a car. You come in, you fill out the form, you get approved versus a background check or a, or a financial document and you can take the firearm or the vehicle home with you. Now if you had to drive to a dealership to purchase a, a, a vehicle, fill out all that paperwork, it gets approved, but you know, you can't take it home till tomorrow, you're probably not gonna buy that vehicle from that person. And you're probably just gonna go home and help you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next, uh, Bernard Carver come down and Richard Smiles to testify. Thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> to address you this evening. I am a retired public school teacher and principal. My wife is a retired public school teacher. We have been Vermonters since 1993. We truly love this state. We are the grandparents of two young girls who along with their parents reside in Vermont. Our granddaughters will both attend public school in the fall. We urge you to consider to enact, continue, excuse me, to enact reasonable gun legislation that will help to make our state a safer place. A waiting period, such as in Senate Bill 169, just makes an abundance of sense from multiple perspectives. One needs only to reflect on the recent suicide of Mr. Black in Essex to understand the need for this legislation. Such legislation is especially important in states like Vermont that have higher than average rates of suicide, especially among adolescents and the elderly. Crimes of passion, such as homicide, could be reduced with legislation that requires a person to wait before acquiring a firearm. Reasonable gun owners understand this. And any inconvenience that a gun purchaser experiences as a result of a wait period is just that, an inconvenience. You and Governor Scott took impressive action last year. Life in Vermont has continued. It is time for you to act again in a reasonable manner and pass additional reasonable gun legislation. Please do this for our grandchildren and the next generation of Vermonters. Thank you. Ian Galbraith, come down and Edward Gilbert, Jr. to testify. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Edward S. Gilbert, Jr. I'm a native born Vermont from Barry City. I served on two fast attack nuclear submarines, a U.S. Navy rescue diver. I've lived in several states, California, Connecticut I certified, down in Boston. These waiting periods are just feel-good legislation. When someone wants to end their life, as tragic as it is, these waiting periods do not work. I've served internationally. It's, and my heart goes out to Mr. and Mrs. Black. I have a son who's 25, who's now serving in the US Air Force. I have a daughter that's 23, that's out in California. And I'm a son that's at the University of Southern Maine. All three of them, I brought them up responsibly on how to handle, maintain, and protect themselves if they ever need it. I do not feel that this legislation or these waiting periods are gonna be effective here in Vermont. Vermont is one of the safest states in the country due to the fact that we have a population that is brought up and raised on how to respect not only authority, but they're trained properly on how to use and maintain 
any firearm. The statistics are very low. I come back to my state, and it's one of the most drug-infested states, as drug-infested in any community I've ever served in a metro area out in California. I would like to see more legislation dealing with helping these people recover from these addictions. I've lived in several states. I just feel this state is safe because they are brought up at a young age on how to conduct themselves as responsible adults. Thank you very much. Stephen, I think it says Reigns, come down, and Bernard Carver to testify. Good evening. I'm the proud uh, grandfather to nine children, and my wife and I live in South Carolina. I'm here to advocate tonight for the measure uh, before you because uh, uh, I want to represent two underrepresented groups in our political system, children and the mentally ill. Science tells us that brains aren't fully developed until you hit the age of approximately 25. So it's no coincidence that uh, gun violence is a major cause of death for teenagers and young adults. So who amongst us did not experience teenage angst? I know I did. When I was a young man, I worked in a mental hospital in a locked ward for almost three years. I, uh, one of my jobs was to answer the suicide prevention phone. People do not necessarily act impulsively if they're contemplating suicide. They can be talked out of it. One of uh, the things I learned from my experience there is that mental illness is a very cyclical kind of illness. People often get into a very dark place if they experience trauma of some kind in their life or miss a medication. You can come back from that very quickly. They uh, have some time to do so, as little as 24 hours sometimes, but usually more. Um, <coughs> Science uh, also tells us that um, one in five person experience some form of mental illness each year. So living in Vermont, uh, as wonderful it is, is not uh, a guarantee uh, against mental illness. It happens here <coughs> every time. Before you act on this legislation, I ask that you consider the following question. What kind of people are we if we don't do whatever we can to support our children and the mentally ill? This measure will be a minor inconvenience to some people, but will almost certainly save lives. Thank you. Dwayne Tucker come down and Ian Galbraith to testify. Uh, thank you. Um, it's interesting that the current bill asks for a 24 hour waiting period and already we had people asking for 72 hours claiming it's just an inconvenience. How long is it going to be before people are coming before this body and the uh, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee asking for five days, seven days, ten days because somebody died after four, five, six days getting it done. Um, there's no provision for exempting gun shows in this. Now, there's only about half a dozen gun shows in the state in the whole year. I think it's highly unlikely that people are going to wait for a gun show to occur and then possibly go in and buy a gun and shoot themselves, or anyone else for that matter. I'm also very curious as to why the couple that brought this before the Senate testified that, and, and this was in both the Free Press and CBS, uh, CX News, that they were unwilling to divulge what triggered their son's suicide. Nobody seems to have asked them what that trigger was. I think knowing that would go a hell of a lot farther than telling people uh, how to prevent someone from killing themselves than the 24 or whatever hour waiting period on getting a gun. Thank you. David Hamilton come down and Stephen Reynas to testify. Chairperson Grad and distinguished members of the House Judiciary Committee. 
I am Stephen Reyes of Callis. I'm an attorney and an ordained deacon in the Episcopal Church. In the 1980s, I served three terms in the House. Then, as a member of the other body, I was the lead sponsor of S-98, which proposed a 10-day waiting period to purchase a handgun. Although S-98 had eight bipartisan co-sponsors and was strongly endorsed by the Vermont Chief of Police Association, the committee to which it was referred did not hold any hearing. I commend your committee for taking up this issue. I've read the news reports and listened to a video excerpt of the testimony of Alyssa and Rob Black, who I heard for the first time tonight, the parents of 23-year-old Andrew Black. I've seen the published photo of Andrew at work on December 3rd, 2018, looking relaxed and content. Three days later, he bought a gun at 1130, and at 4 o'clock, he was dead. Andrew's photo, to me, is compelling evidence that we should have a waiting period in the body. Human experience teaches that the world can look very different a few days later. Andrew's parents had good grounds for their belief that Andrew would be alive if a waiting period had been in effect. Having to wait a few days to get a gun pales in significance to the loss of Andrew and so many others. I see this as a moral issue. S-169 would create a huge exemption from the background check and waiting period requirements with the most expansive definition of immediate family I've ever heard of. And just because a person is somehow related is no guarantee that a waiting period is of no value. A constitutional right does not mean it is immune from reasonable regulation for protection of society. Ed Wilson come down and Dwayne Tucker to testify. Good evening everyone. My name is Dwayne Tucker. I stand here before you on behalf of myself and the people of Washington County, Vermont. Again, Vermont legislature has proven its limited ability to reason. We see how easily our leaders are able to push a completely unnecessary agenda with a bill as a matter of fact, is as far from necessary as one could possibly fathom. S-169, introduced and passed by Vermont State Legislature, is a completely, complete waste of time, energy, and taxpayers' dollars. Law-abiding citizens and young, well-rounded adults who have been brought up on moral and principled values are people who know the difference between right and wrong, should not have laws imposed that violate our constitutional rights. The real concern that Vermont le legislation needs to be focused on is developmental and psychological disorders and mental health treatment. <clears throat> I'm asking you to redirect your attention, energy, and focus on possible early intervention programs and treatment for the individuals that need psychological help. Create the resources and make them readily available for the individuals that need them. Introducing nonsense bills into legislation and infringing on the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens is not the right answer. <clears throat> I ask you to listen to logic, conduct the studies, use statistical information, and put forth the right effort to do the right thing. <clears throat> In short, I'm asking you to take into consideration the fact that S-169 will only affect the people that follow the law and will ultimately have no effect on helping individuals with mental health issues. Please do the right thing. Thank you. Julia Gresser come down and David Hamilton to testify. Good evening. I am David Hamilton. I reside in Burlington. I'm an Episcopal priest serving as a parish priest at present but for many years also practiced as a licensed psychotherapist. It is particularly from my experience as a psychotherapist that I wish to address the importance of a waiting period for the purchase of guns. 
I have had many occasions when a patient will experience the transitory grip of the darkness of depression, which momentarily feels all-encompassing and hopeless. At such a time of anguish, there can be a desperate and impulsive wish for the alleviation of this deep pain. At such a time, suicidal thoughts and a driving force for relief can feel all-consuming. <coughs> it is precisely at this point that we as a society have a responsibility to not conspire with the forces of darkness. Interrupting the compulsion to purchase a gun by a statutory waiting period of at least 72 hours gives the therapeutic relationship and the intervention of family and friends a fighting chance for the depressed person to weather the storm of depression and desperation. The world can look very different inside and outside several days after such a crisis. As a parish priest, helping people cope with grief is part and parcel of parish life. The grief over the loss of a friend or a relative to suicide are among the deepest and most profound experiences of grief. There is never just one victim of suicide. Suicide has a deathly ripple effect on family, friends, and the wider community. All experience a death, a death of the spirit, when a suicide occurs. A significant waiting period, at least 72 hours, to interrupt the impulsive drive toward the purchase of a gun is, in its widest scope, a public health policy that will benefit all of us. Thank you. Bob, will you come down? Ed Wilson to testify. Ed Wilson, Morris Phil. Our legislature is proposing a waiting period for all gun purchasers in response to one person out of 40,000 gun purchasers committing suicide. One would think that they're very concerned with human life, except they just passed a bill, a law, allowing abortions up until the moment of birth. And regardless of how you feel about marijuana, is there anyone who doubts that more people will die in car accidents and other means as marijuana is legalized? It is obviously not a concern for life that drives this legislature. In this legislature, there are people who just don't like guns and believe that you shouldn't have them and will do everything possible to make it more difficult to own, buy, and use guns. Even though these legislators took an oath to uphold and defend the U.S. and Vermont constitutions, they're willing to break their oaths to achieve their own agendas. Tonight there will be people who profess to be hunters and gun owners who will tell us that they see nothing in this law that will hinder their ability to shoot a deer. I want to remind them that the Second Amendment is about shooting tyrants, not deer. We are here to protect our God-given right to self-defense as enumerated in the Second Amendment and Article 16. As this legislature contemplates ways to make gun ownership more onerous, I urge the legislators to contact your peers in New York and Connecticut and see what the compliance rate has been regarding registering semi-automatic rifles and other guns and accessories. Ask the state police and sheriffs to look into compliant rates also. You will find that they're low because people will not give up their rights and you do no service to Vermont residents by passing laws that will make us into criminals. I will not comply with unconstitutional laws. Thank you. Brad Klein, come down, and Julia Gresser to testify. My name is Julia Grosser and I live in Montpelier. I'm a mental health uh, psychotherapist. I'm sorry to have to share with you a painful story tonight. It must be very difficult to sit here for two hours and listen to some difficult stories. I've never talked about this publicly and have only shared it with my closest friends, but I feel that um, this is an important piece of legislation for you tonight. When I do talk about um, when I do talk about this with close friends, I never share the details. Um, but a decision to vote on this bill can literally save lives and protect countless people from suffering lifelong trauma. 
So these stories must be told, and you who have the power uh, to change future stories, uh, I hope will listen. Many, many years ago, on the last summer evening of August, the day before school started, my friend Bobby, who was 17, and his mom had an argument. His older brother, my high school sweetheart, and I were in the backyard and could hear them fighting. His 12-year-old sister, Wendy, was in her bedroom next to his. Bobby hated school and had just gotten a part-time job doing something that he loved. His mother came home late from work, exhausted and frustrated with him for taking a job when she felt he would need to focus on school. His dad had moved out the year before. It had been a very rough year for the family. But Bobby was not chronically depressed. In fact, he generally had a sunny disposition, but that night he was angry, frustrated, and discouraged. He went into his sister's room and told her he was leaving. He was taking off, getting away from mom, school, and home. Not long afterward, he returned to her room and told her he couldn't run away because he had nowhere to go. We listened from the backyard and thought things were settling down. We decided we needed to go inside. We decided we did not need to go inside and provide mediation. I was 19 years old. My boyfriend, Bobby's brother, was 20. There were a few minutes of quiet summer breezes and then the sound of the gun cocking, followed by the explosion of the gun. All right, thank you. Mike Carver will come down and Rob Reedy to testify. Bob Reedy Barker. My heartfelt condolences to Andrew's family and friends. I'm no stranger to suicides. I've had to deal with it four times in my life. The most recent January 8th of this year, <coughs> um, a highly decorated Marine Corps gunny sergeant took his own life. We know why he did it. We have a pretty good idea as to why he did it. But we're powerless to stop him. This law will do nothing. Powerless. Remind Dr. John Weeks, in his inaugural address stated, our God-given rights, as enshrined in the U.S. and Vermont Constitution, are not open for negotiations. They cannot be legislated away, nor can they be regulated away. Any, any person, any organization, government that attempts to do so will be met with the strongest resistance. Suicide's a horrible thing. My rights are my rights. And you keep chipping away. Judge Benitez, this past Friday, Ninth Circuit Court, federal mind you, declared that the magazine ban and capacity ban in California is unconstitutional. I highly recommend that you look at his summation and because from a constitutional and liberty standpoint, it is brilliant. Brilliant. We've got the Second Amendment, and we've got Article 16. To those legislatures, legislators, I'm sorry, who honor their oath and abide by the Constitution, thank you. We applaud your efforts. To those that don't, we will not sit down we will not shut up, and we will not go quietly into that cold, dark night. I am a responsible gun owner. You're not gonna stop suicide. You're trying to apply a political solution to a societal problem. You are. It's not going to work. Thank you. Mary Cox come down and Thad Klein to testify. Hello, my name is Thad Klein and I'm from Westminster, West Vermont. I've been working in mental health for well over 35 years. Uh, just last Sunday would have been uh, the birthday of uh, Kurt Vonnegut who said if Jesus was to come down from heaven and be here now, he'd be an atheist. I want to know if Jesus came down now, would he be packing a gun of some sort, or would he 
ask for people to take time before they want to kill themselves. And I have figures here. Oops, let me go oh, here. Uh, because we are asking for science, it only takes 20 seconds to look at the comparison of the different types of successibility to killing yourself. Okay, this study is called Lethality of uh, Suicide Methods. This took me 20 seconds to find. It's case fatality rates by suicide methods. In, US, in eight U.S. states from 1989 to 1997. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to put my glasses on quickly. You can see on this graph that successful deaths caused by firearms is 82.5%. The next one was drowning, 65.9. Suffocating, hanging, 61.4. Uh, poisoned by gas, 41.5 and so on, it goes all the way down to other at about 8%, and cut and pierce is at 1.2, okay? So we're at 82.5% is the amount of people that have successfully managed to kill themselves with firearms. And I think that stands for what's happened here in the state of Vermont. We know that death is wrong, and we know that firearms are the things that are calling the majority of the deaths in this state from causing deaths. I have had to work now close to six years uh, in mental health in the state of Vermont, and I can say truthfully that there's only been, thank you, there's only been so, much, so many people who have come to commit suicide. Ed Cutler come down and Mike Caribou testify. Thank you for having me today. <clears throat> I'd like to state that I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. I've had numerous businesses in Montpelier. I currently live in Plainfield and I have three children. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it be noble in the mind, to suffer the, sing the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and take arms against the sea of troubles. That is the question. All of you were elected to uphold the constitutions and respect the values of the citizens in this republic. Senator Sears said, it is all about compromise. They, <coughs> they want 48, we compromised for 24. No, sir. We were compromised when you chose to violate our Second Amendment and Article 16 rights attacking law-abiding citizens. S-55 was an absolute, was an assault on our right to keep and bear arms, and S-169 is yet another feel-good measure unsupported by statistics, especially when one considers the fair, new, the fair Haven incident. If you don't believe this op oppression, Look at the consequences of the charges brought against the youth, juxtaposed to those we have been subjected to ourselves. Our sea of troubles is the legislation coming from this body of electorates. One taking of our rights rapidly followed by another, then rushed through committee while you still have a majority. Our sea of orange garments represents our outcry to stop Pushing law abiding, punishing law abiding citizens. And remember, this is a republic. You swore an oath to protect, not a platform for political correctness and feel good measures. Thank you for your time. Nelson Rodriguez come down and Mary Cox to testify. Good evening, my name is Mary Cox. I'm from Burlington. I'm uh, a member of NAMI Vermont, but I'm speaking here today um, as a sister of a brother who committed suicide some 19 years ago. I'm a mother, but um, what I want to focus on this evening, since I just have the two minutes, is that I'm also a veteran of the Coast Guard Active and Reserve, 27 years. And I wanted to speak to um, the veterans issues involved with this bill. Um, having my brother commit suicide and having experienced that loss 
It's broke my heart in recent years to see the suicide rates amongst veterans in the United States. Nationally, in 2016, 20 veterans per day committed suicide. 69% of those veteran suicide deaths were by firearms. It's not just through the United States, it's here in Vermont, tragically, and I um, have a, a data sheet here from the VA with the Vermont specific statistics on it. Um, in Vermont, the veteran suicide rate um, is 56.8%, which is higher than the Northeast rate of 23.9% and the national rate of 30.1%. So we're particularly high in this rate and the, on, on the suicide rate amongst veterans in Vermont. And in fact, when we compare all of the states, we're one of the very highest, we rank amongst the highest of suicide rates amongst veterans. Um, nine out of 10 people who attempt suicide unsuccessfully do not go on to die by suicide. However, the suicide attempt using a firearm is over 80% successful. So having a reasonable waiting period makes sense. When people are in crisis, when veterans are in crisis, when people with mental health issues are in crisis, having a reasonable waiting period where they can get help, they can get community support. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Grant come down and Ed Cutler to testify. Um. Ed Cutler is yielding his position in the line to me. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to have to say no, and the reason being is people waited in line, and, and it's a first come, first serve basis, and uh, we're going to be pretty strict about sticking with the the program that we had planned on doing. So either Ed's going to have to come down to testify, or we will go over to a member of, of Pro 169. Thank you. I already spoke. I, as you know, I spoke in committee, so I was hoping to get her on. Uh, she's one of the victims I talked about the fire on to protect herself against an abusive spouse. So I thought it would have been better for her to say her own story. Um, all I can say is we are trying in this organization to protect women, children, everybody. As you know, and we have a little bit of a difference on suicides when people just go out and buy a firearm and commit suicide instantly. The video I showed you said one. We looked at it and we were very liberal on our numbers and we had three. The three were the black son, um, the teacher at the Vermont Law School who waited actually two days after she bought that firearm, and the uh, one who was at the uh, gun shop where he bought a firearm and did that, and that was over 20 years ago. So we're looking at legislation now that will not save anybody and it will hurt other people, people that need to defend themselves against abuses, abusers, against rabbit animals, which were on the increase. Just the other day, or a couple of weeks ago, we had a bobcat attack, two people in St. Johnsbury, or oh, excuse me, um, you know, White River. So, you know, rat, ra rabbit is on the increase. There's a number of other things that are on the increase. We need to keep innocent victims from being harmed by abusive parents, abusive husbands, abusive boyfriends. I urge you to take the background checks, excuse me, the uh, waiting periods out, leave the Rogers bills in, and protect the people of Vermont. Thank you. Lauren Emerson, come down, and Nelson Rodriguez to testify. Thank you. My name is Nelson Rodriguez, and I'm a student at Champlain College. I'm also a respite provider at the Howard Center, 
and assistant track and field coach at Essex High School. I'm here to ask my fellow citizens who are on the other side of this issue, what is wrong with simple regulation? We do the same thing with our First Amendment, First Amendment, freedom of speech. You can't yell fire in a movie theater. A well-relegated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This is an amendment that was ratified in 1791. If you do not take this step forward with this bill, we are taking a step backwards. We need to solve this problem instead of adapting to it. Vermont has an opportunity to be a state that leads in firearm regulations, and we need to eliminate the notion that carrying a gun is the American way of solving a problem. If more guns is a solution, then by, ne by definition, Amer America would be the safest country in the world. But just last year, there were 288 school shootings since 2009. Canada came in second with just two. The American way of solving problem is failing. Our thoughts and prayers are failing. How many more lives need to be lost in, or in order for us to be on the same side for simple regulation? This bill is not, a complete, is not a complete ban on firearms, but regulation. Nowhere does it say we are banning all guns. Let's be clear. I do believe that a majority of gun owners are safe and responsible gun owners. But we're talking about the access to guns. I'm afraid there are people out there who are not receiving the help that they need, and their access to guns is far too easy. Again, my name is Nelson Rodriguez. Thank you for your time. Lanny Colby, come down, and Paul Legrand to testify. My name is Paul Legrand. <clears throat> I work evenings, and I'm missing time and pay to be here today and for every person here in attendance. I believe there are many others who would be but are not able to attend this hearing. After a bitter custody battle and separation, a single mother escaped her physically and emotionally abusive ex to attempt a new start with her two children. Because of the past abuse and threats of violence, she was able to obtain a restraining order against him. Frightened and traumatized, she stayed with friends and family members temporarily while trying to figure out her next move. Out of concern for her personal and family safety, she went to a sporting goods store to purchase a firearm for protection. She was able to pass the background check immediately, but was unable to purchase the gun because of a mandated waiting period. That night, while alone, she received a rash of threatening messages from her ex. He vowed to take the kids and make her pay. Terrified, she called the police. Within minutes, her ex kicked down the door to the residence, screaming and threatening. With no way to protect herself against the larger, violent attacker, he beat her bloody and unconscious. Soon after the police arrived to find the horrific scene, she later died of her injuries at the hospital. The right to keep and bear arms is constitutionally protected and shall not be infringed. According to Google, the word infringe means to act so as to limit or undermine, to encroach on, to erode, diminish, weaken, impair, damage, or compromise. Please keep in mind that just because a law is passed does not mean it's constitutionally illegal. As was just previously mentioned, as an example, last Friday, March 29th, in the case of Duncan v. Becerra, California's U.S. Southern District Court ruled that California's ban on commonly possessed firearm magazines and the imposition of a 10-round magazine limit is in violation of the Second Amendment of the Constitution. Last year's Vermont Senate Bill, S-55, is similar and also an infringement. I sympathize with you as lawmakers faced with what to do about the tragic events we hear about in the news. I will assume that your concerns are gender and not part of a hidden agenda. Unfortunately, passing gun control laws is too easy. The appearance of doing something when you don't know what to do. Thank you very much. Brian Sheldon come down and Laurie Emerson to testify. Good evening. My name is Laurie Emerson. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. NAMI Vermont supports Bill S-169 with an amendment to include a 72-hour waiting period, not just 24 hours, and to include all firearms, not just handguns. Our concern is in preventing suicides. Any measure we can take to save lives is our goal. Suicide is a community health issue that can be prevented once again, suicide can be prevented. 
That's why we are calling on you as lawmakers to pass legislation that will address suicide. On average, one person dies by suicide every three days in Vermont. Vermont had 118 suicide deaths in 2017. More than 10 times as many people die by suicide in Vermont annually than by homicide. VPR collected data on firearm suicides in Vermont from 2011 to 2016 and reported that 63% used handguns and 36% used long guns. We need to save all lives to suicide by including all firearms in this legislation. About 85% of people who use a firearm in the suicide attempt die from their injury. <coughs> However, 90% of people who survive a suicide attempt do not go on to die by suicide. Research also indicates that the interval between deciding to act and attempting suicide can be as short as five or 10 minutes. And people tend not to substitute a different method when a highly lethal method is unavailable or difficult to access. Therefore, increasing the time interval with a waiting period can be life-saving. According to the CDC report, researchers found that more than half of the people who died by suicide did not have a known diagnosed mental illness at the time of their death. So preventing suicide involves everyone in the community and state, and I hope that we can count on you to develop comprehensive policies and laws to prevent suicide. Thank you for listening to my comments. Bob Richard, come down. Randy Colby, testify. Thank you folks for allowing me to speak here. Uh, I didn't write anything down, not a very good public speaker, but there are a couple of things I really would like to point out to you. First and foremost is the 16th Amendment in the state of Vermont. You have sworn to uphold and protect it. And I think you should take that very seriously. I understand the suicides and anyone dying from a gun or any other measure is traumatic for the people involved. And I have a granddaughter that actually has tried to commit suicide twice. What I have read looking into things is that people who try to attempt suicides usually attempt it two or three times before they're successful. Spur of the moment things can happen. Legislation obviously doesn't stop problems. You have drug control problems, you got laws against it. You got laws against murdering people, people do it. Those who don't have respect for the law are not going to comply, period. The other thing I'd like to bring to your attention is there is a, and I can't quote it verbatim, but there is a spot in our Constitution that says you cannot make or enforce a law against one individual or group of individuals for the ambulance and gratification of another group of individuals or individual. This is ambulance and gratification for those who are willing to supersede our constitutional rights. That's wrong. Um, in closing, I'd like to just make a single statement. Please stop the assault on our Constitution and the slaughter of our freedoms. Thank you. Constance Kincaid Brown come down and Brian Sheldon to testify. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Brian Sheldon. I'm a Vermont native and a resident of Essex. I want to thank Chairman Grad and the members of the Judiciary Committee for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Um, my grandfather and my uh, nephew Cody are big hunters. Um, often when I visit my uh, sister in Texas, she, my 22-year-old nephew is not around because it's one hunting season or the other. Um, I'm, I'm pleased uh, for that reason that my grandfather's uh, rifles got handed down to my nephew who was, who was able to use them to train properly with them and to um, treat, the, treat the, those rifles with respect. Uh, that said, when I heard about um, when I heard about Andrew, I identified with him very strongly. I'm uh, a fellow met a fellow graduate of Essex Junction High School. I'm uh, also a, a alumni of the Essex Youth Hockey Association. Um, it it uh, is I didn't know him personally, but I um, I could also see walking into a into a, a gun store, um, buying a gun, and less than a day later, um, uh, killing myself. Um, also recently, I was um, I was at Lawson's just this week, um, and I realized, I didn't realize this until recently that he um, he, he worked there. So he could have been um, he could have brewed the beer that I'd had just this week. Um, so I don't um, 
I know when you buy when you buy a house in in uh, Vermont, it's going to, you're going to be able to uh, you're not going to be able to do that in under in under 24 hours. I don't think um, having having a delay is a, a big infringement um, for for a gun, especially when we know that it works. Um, I'm, I'm, I was interested in many of the people testifying today saying that it doesn't work. When I sat back there and Googled the, Googled the, Googled the results saying that, that uh, in the states that passed uh, the handgun delays, um, that violence had gone down by 17% uh, in those states. Um, so um, I, I hope that, uh, I, I think that uh, 24 hours is a good start, um, but 72 hours would be better. Thank you for, for this opportunity to speak. Jerry Mullen come down and Bob Richard to testify. Bob Richard of Franklin and Waitsfield, Vermont, of Abenaki descent. I've lost family members. Everyone here has lost a friend or family member from self-infliction of one way or another. There's always going to be another, another way. Put, putting this in the legislation isn't going to stop it. I mean, if you're determined, it's going to happen. You'll never stop this in uh, sad reality of every civilization and all, of all demographics. Until society changes its desensation of life, which seems to happen more and more from the younger generations of uh, spending too much time killing people on the Xbox, not enough time with the tackle box. Uh, th this is no more than another knee-jerk reaction to put legislation, legislative infringements on my culture and everyone's Second Amendment. Thank you. Kathleen Shepard come down and Constance Kincaid Brown to testify. My name is Constance Kincaid Brown. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. I am one of the co facilitators of the Greater Claremont Survivors of Suicide Loss Support Group. Our group is made up primarily of survivors of suicide loss from Sullivan County in New Hampshire and Windsor County in Vermont. You can guess that I'm here to speak on behalf of 169. I am also the survivor of domestic violence. Other folks here today have told you about a lot of statistics and percentages. I know only too well from domestic <coughs> experience what those statistics and percentages feel like. First, as a survivor of domestic violence, I learned that preemptive strike doesn't work. At best, it gets you labeled as a co-combatant and subject to legal action. At worst, it can make you the murderer of your fa children's father. During the opening of each of our suicide loss support groups, I introduce myself to role model the process to any newcomers, which we have all too often. My opening goes like this. My name is Connie. I lost my 22-year-old son, Duncan, August 13, 2016, to a self-inflicted gunshot wound. It is one of the few places that I can talk about the means. As we go around the room, the ratio changes from night to night, but guns are often the primary means, usually on impulse after some sudden loss. The trauma caused by the sudden loss of the one that died does not end with the one that died. It ricochets to the deceased family, friends, and community, impacting even people who did not know them or even like them. Almost all su survivors report experiencing some level of PTSD, even if they are spared witnessing or finding the body of their loved one. As a group, we are doing what we can to stem the tide of suicide and mass <coughs> shootings. We ask you to do what you can. Pete Lawton come down and Jerry Mullen to testify. I start when the wind goes green. Okay. I'm Jerry Mullen, former selectman from Bolton. Um, I am very opposed to gun violence. As such, I qualified as a hunter safety instructor in 1962. I later 
at the request of Jim Cardell, head of the phys ed department at Burlington High, built and taught a firearm safety and marksmanship course at the school. About 40 years ago, I had a young lady in my class who was doing very, very poorly in my freshman science class. Murray had met Mr. Perfect, and she was in love. She dropped out almost as soon as she could, and I didn't see her for a long time. <coughs> About 10 years later, I ran into her where she was waiting table at the, uh, the uh, Tower Restaurant in South Burlington. At this point, she had two children, a divorce, and a restraining order. It turned out Mr. Perfect was a physical abuser. I used to see her occasionally when Jane and I would stop down at the restaurant, and she got very, very, very concerned because he kept calling her and ranting and raving and threatening. If your time-lapse bill here, your bill to um, have a waiting period had existed, Marie would have died one night, and probably the two children as well. He broke into the house. She had been quite concerned, and just the day before, she had bought a pistol. I guess the lesson is, don't ever bring a baseball bat to a gunfight. I would like to point out also that if you go online and type in police requirement to protect individuals, you will find that there are court cases, even up to the Supreme Court, which say that police protect society, not you. The last time we had an attempted home invasion at my house in, 1907, in 2007, it took the state police three hours to get there. I think I'm done. Thank you, folks. I would like to say please oppose this bill. Jack Friedman, come down to testify. Uh, the flags, unfortunately, are considered banners, and at the beginning of the night, it was stated that uh, no banners. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen Shepard to testify. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah, Kathleen Shepard to testify. And I called Jack Friedman down on, to be on deck. I may have I may have screwed up on that. I apologize. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify in favor of Senate Bill 169. My name is Kathleen Shepard, a resident of Norwich, Vermont, for 40 years, a retired school teacher, and a grandmother, and a member of Gun Sense Vermont. Since it began, not long after the six educators, just like me, and 26-year-olds, just like my grandchildren, were gunned down in Newtown, Connecticut, in a town just like mine. As an educator and parent, I know how impulsive young people can be and how overwhelmed they can be by temporary feelings. Most of us have seen the current brain research that shows that the frontal cortex, that part of our brains that moderates our feelings with reasoning, does not complete its development until people are well into their 20s. That's what we hear too often, far too often, the terrible news of a young person taking his or her own life. Just two years ago, I got that tragic news from a dear friend who is with me today at this hearing. Her young son's life ended with a gun suicide. I am concerned about how easy it is for young people in our state to get a gun on an impulse. Suicide is almost always an impulsive act of those who survive a suicide attempt. The vast majority never attempt it again. And long-term studies show that 90% of them do not go on to die of suicide. Suicidal crises are often short-lived. By delaying or limiting access to guns among those at risk, we can save lives. Waiting period laws can make all the difference between having had a bad day and a suicide that ends a life and devastates loved ones forever. The cooling off period can allow a gun purchaser. I'm grateful that the uh, legislature passed an extreme risk prevention order in the last session. Families who have a well-founded fear that loved ones intend to harm self or others can get the help of law enforcement and healthcare providers should also be able to use the ERPO law Gun violence in our state is the root of a, help, of a public health program, a, a problem, and we need to address that. Thank you.
Paul Bain to come down and Pete Lawton to testify. I'm Pete Lawton from Albert, Vermont. And first I'd like to say I feel sad for the black, black family and their loss. And I don't have any words to say how I don't can't say how you people must feel. But on the other hand, I'm a strong Second Amendment advocate. I've been a member of my family fight in every war that this nation's been in. I took the oath to protect and defend this country when I was 18, and I went overseas with a lot of young guys and never came back. So this, <clears throat> this document called the Constitution, very important to me. I, <clears throat> I don't know what kind of world we're living in today with Vermont legislators, they, they legalize drugs, and then they have places where meth addicts can come and shoot up, and I don't know what they expect the final result to be from that. I mean, you're gonna get more of this. I mean, I grew up in the 50s. We worked, our parents made sure we told the mark. I've never seen anything like this. I don't even know what country I'm in today. I turn on the news, I don't know. Vermont used to be a quiet, nice place to live. It's all you see is drug addicts, suicides, and I don't believe this legislation will do anything to curb that. This is law-abiding gun owners. It's our constitution, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Is there problems with it? Obviously, there's problems with everything. But uh, I'm going to vote no for this waiting period. So anyway, thanks for your time. Eddie Garcia, come down, and Jack Friedman to testify. I want to thank you for you folks listening to me today. Uh, my name is Jack Friedman, uh, Island Pond and Danville. Uh, father of five, grandfather of 11. Uh, had firearms in our house, seems forever. Uh, my wife and I were competitive shooters, children have all been, and grandchildren, the ones old enough have all been trained safely. Uh, I can't, having said that, I can't imagine losing a child for any reason, or a grandchild. Uh, but I also know that this bill, in my heart anyway, won't do a darn thing to stop it. Uh, my wife is a, a GAL on the court system. I'm very proud of her, proud of the work she does. And she works with children from all kinds of abusive environments, whether it be due to drugs or alcohol, or in some cases, uh, some cases, uh, violent environments. And uh, I can't understand why uh, a woman who had been threatened and it does happen, uh, should be denied her right uh, under Article 16. I mean, under, under human rights, but under Article 16 of the Vermont Constitution uh, to defend herself. Uh, that's not the Second Amendment. It's a, I urge you to reread it. And uh, I wouldn't want her to become a statistic at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the other thing is I've, I had to ask, you know, I don't understand how the legislature squares the passage of an assisted suicide bill and a late-term abortion bill uh, with stepping on our neck to try to limit our constitutional rights. You had no problem passing those things, or very little. And uh, as a grandfather that's heard the heartbeats in utero of my grandchildren, uh, you guys are in a moral hole. Thank you. Sarah Toscano, come down and Paul Dane to testify. You know, it's really not too much to ask that, that simple thing with, uh, as far as, uh, you know, waiting uh, what, what we have uh, deemed to be banners. I realize that they're the American flag. I realize they're the American flag, but we, we have uh, the rules that we set, and, and, and we're going to abide by them. Thank we you. We do not agree that this is going to be a fine as the We never had a Take that one down, too. Uh, <laughs> you, can, 
You can go ahead, Paul. Uh, I may be one of the only people who speaks today against a waiting period who is not a gun owner. But one of the reasons I don't own a firearm today is because I know Vermont has said very liberal gun laws. And by liberal, I mean classically liberal. I mean rooted in liberty. Uh, the reason that liberties, like the ones in our state and U.S. Constitution, exist are to give people assurances that the government that's over them can be trusted because it trusts them. When those liberties are removed or slowly eroded, the mutual trust between the governing and the governed also erodes. I've never owned a firearm because I've trusted that when I do need, uh, feel the need like I'll have, uh, that I'll need to have access to one, I can pass a background check like I've done plenty of times for professional licenses or getting a, a license for foster care. And that trust has been enough for me to refrain from purchasing one. But that trust has been eroded. Uh, just as last year when it was demonstrated that I wasn't trusted to own a standard 30 round magazine, I knew that if I was ever going to need one in the future, I had to buy it now. It wasn't a choice I could defer any longer because you were taking away my right and ability to make that decision later. Ironically, your attempt to take certain firearms out of my home had the unintended consequence of putting them in there for the first time. I now own multiple 30 round magazines, but no firearm to attach them to, at least not yet. And that's why I oppose the imposition of a new waiting period, because if someday in the future, I feel that I may need to purchase a firearm for my family's safety or protection, if the store is closed over the weekend or federal or state holiday, I may not have access to the firearm for several days. That's an infringement upon a right I've never abused, a right that I've never even used to this point. I've never done anything that would warrant your distrust. So why are you taking that right away from me now and my family? If you pass this waiting period, the message you're sending is that you no longer trust law-abiding non-gun owners like me. And the indirect message it sends to me and the hundreds of other people is we better buy our guns and ammunition before, uh, while we can before it's too late. It's not a message I want to hear. It's not a message I want my neighbors to hear, that we're not to be trusted. This is a message that will put more guns in homes sometimes for the first time. Look what happens to gun sales when, when gun control legislation is being considered. Thank you very much. Vicki Wendell, come down, and Eddie Garcia to testify. I was angry when I wrote this, so if it seems overly harsh in places, it's because I find that I've had to be here far too many times to defend my rights. Now we are engaging this bill requiring a 24-hour waiting period for handgun purchases undertaken in the wake of an adult suicide by firearm. As we engage this, it was brought to my attention this morning that in the wake of this morning's shooting in my town of St. Johnsbury, Gun Sense Vermont is about to bring back a call for so-called safe storage, which means locking your firearms out of your own reach in your own home. Frankly, I feel tired of the gun control advocates' instant Pavlovian re reaction to every incident involving a firearm being to call for more restrictions on those who have nothing to do with the incident. I find this, frankly, to be ghoulish, morally reprehensible, and exploitative. I tire of this. I tire of anti-gun legislators exploiting grief-stricken survivors as a weapon against your right to the means to defend yourself, your home, your family, and your loved ones. A right delayed is a right denied. And while the proponents of this bill propose restrictions on me based on the suicide of an adult who, what guns he already owned, were taken from him by his parents with whom he lived, for whatever reason they took those guns, the parents who, when he was 16 years old, bought a beer-making kit, which he learned to use, who had just been dumped by his girlfriend, a life clearly marked by depression, substance abuse, as well as a previous suicide in the family, instead of talking about him, I'm going to talk about somebody else, a woman from New Jersey named Carol Bone. Carol Bone was brutally stabbed to death waiting for her New Jersey gun permit. New Jersey law states that a pistol permit is to be issued or denied within 32, or 30 days. 42 days after applying for a pistol permit, Carol Bone was murdered by her abusive ex in her driveway. 42 days longer than 24 hours, but an angry, psychotic ex can act quite quickly. So if you're ghoulish, exploitative legislation, I say this to the legislators who salivate the prospect of doing another injury to the rights of law-abiding Vermonters. If your ghoulish, exploitative legislation results in the murder of an innocent to whom you deny the human right to self-defense, if we wake one morning to read of a Carol Bone here in Vermont because you inconvenienced her by denying her the ability to protect herself, that blood will be on your hands. Roger Stoddard come down and Sarah Toscano to testify. My name is Sarah and I'm from Hinesburg. Pardon me. Pardon me for Um, 
When my husband left me, he decided it'd be easier to strangle me than divorce me. I fought him off, but he was a Burlington, Vermont social worker, so not only did I have to run to a hotel, I was refused help everywhere I went. My friend took me to a gun shop. He explained to me how to handle the firearm, because I actually was afraid of them beforehand. Um, and took me out and showed me uh, both how to protect, protect myself with the gun and to protect myself in general. By this time, four days had passed and I had not slept uh, since my ex had been calling me and telling me I had better not piss him off um, in the future. My instructor friend pleaded with me in the future, please don't wait, just ask for help. You know, and that I could have you know, been safer sooner. I slept for the first time that night. I did not have to worry about what he could do to me. I wish I knew the uh, I wish I knew the empowerment and safety I could have felt with the firearm the minute my life was threatened. And I wish that the that level of safety for everyone who is law abiding in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Nip, come down, and Vicky Lindell to testify. Hi. Um, I had things to say, but the more I've been listening, the more I think on, um, you know, last year, my then nine-year-old grandson said he wanted to die. Um, he didn't. We intervened. Um, you know, this would have done nothing to help him. He's nine. He can't buy a gun until you're 21. Um, I've heard people talking about how um, the children and teens, you know, well, they're not old enough to buy a gun. And handguns cost an incredible amount of money. Um, I see guns all the time I'd like to buy, but I cannot afford them. Um, so that being said, um, this will do nothing to prevent suicides or self-harm or harming others. Um, there's a black market. This will drive up the black market. The bad guys that are out there are the ones that um, break into people's homes and steal guns and trade them for drugs. Um, those <coughs> bad people will be out there waiting to sell some, anybody a gun that has the money. $100, $50, whatever it takes. Um, <coughs> This will be a victory for the black market if this passes. Um, the criminals are just like, yes, please pass this because we need the business. We, we want people to not buy guns in a gun store. Um, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Tom Jeremy come down and Roger Stoddard to testify. Hello, my name is Roger Stoddard, and I live in Morgan, Vermont. I had to take time off work today to be here, come speak in opposition to S-169's waiting period on handgun purchases. I'm discouraged that once again, it has become necessary to speak up for freedom in this state. I'm a natural-born Vermonter, the descendant of many generations of natural-born Vermonters. Like most Vermonters, I just wanted to be left alone and live my life in the way my parents did. But here I am again, back in Montpelier, compelled to take a stand in preserving our freedom. I drove down here today braving potholes, texting drivers, drug drivers, non-citizen drivers, all to do something that I never should have had to do, argue to preserve freedom for Vermonters. Bill S-169 has been advertised as a bill to stop impulsive suicide. I'd say the rights of the people of the state of Vermont are worth more than that. While I do have much compassion, great compassion for the families of the people who've committed suicide. I also have it for families of the people killed by drunk drivers and texting drivers and people who've overdosed on drugs, etc. None of these should push us to give up our precious freedoms of which others have fought and died for. There are other ways to help people in crisis that don't involve stripping the rights from all the rest of us who aren't. Under the proposed bill, even after being cleared by the federal NICS system, if I wanted to buy a handgun at Perro's Gun Shop in Waterbury, 
I'd have to make two trips from Morgan to Waterbury. That's a huge waste of financial, environmental, and time resources. To anyone who says that if uh, only one life is saved by this bill, then it would be worth it, I'd say you don't value your freedom the way many of us in this room do. In fact, I feel that philosophy belittles the sacrifices our soldiers have made to secure and maintain our freedom. Freedom is not free. I urge you all to oppose Bill 169's waiting period and any other bill that chisels away at our rights and freedoms. Thank you for having me. Michael Morgan come down and Jennifer Knipp to testify. So this is very hard for me to come here and share my very personal story. I am a Vermonter, a mom of two girls, a daughter, a wife, an Iraqi war veteran. I have a full-time job and a part-time job and an MBA that helped me get there. I used to be a regional airline pilot and I was previously married. This man beat me to within an inch of my life and pushed me into a bathtub one night. I lost consciousness and suffered a concussion. Because of this, I live with debilitating headaches and vertigo. This incident ultimately caused me to lose my flying career. What was worse than that was the stalking, the sleepless nights, and the fear stemming from the split. One day I decided to dust off my handgun and go to the range. I had a gentleman at the range step in and give me some pointers. I left that day with a newfound confidence. For the first time in a long time, I slept well that night. I knew that I could defend myself against my six foot two ex-husband if I needed to. I'm here because I'm doing this for my two girls. If any of you are for women's rights and equality, you should vehemently oppose any new gun legislation. A firearm is the only thing that levels the playing field for a woman. I don't want somebody to have to wait 24 hours to purchase a firearm to defend herself. I know that abusers will stop at nothing, and 24 hours might just be too long. And since I have a couple extra minutes, I want to share a quote from the ruling in California on the standard capacity magazines. This decision is a freedom calculus decided long ago by colonists who cherished individual freedom more than the subservient security of a British ruler. The freedom they thought for, fought for was not free of cost to them and is not free now. These knee-jerk, feel-good reactions have to stop in the state. Hang on just a second, I've got to call somebody down. All you're doing is cutting into time for people to testify. Uh, Rule Peterson come down and Tom Drummy is testifying. I want to first start off by offering my condolences to the family of Andrew Black. As a first responder in my local community and a college student in today's society, I see suicide and depression on almost a weekly basis. Depression and suicide are both extremely complex issues that many times someone cannot overcome alone. These people are frequently left with feelings of hopelessness, despair, unwantedness, or a feeling that they burden those around them. I can most certainly tell you that these feelings don't go away overnight. These people do not simply wake up the next day, see the birds chirping and the sun shining, and they're magically cured of their disease. No, it goes on for days and even weeks. In the years between 2005 and 2018, the CDC reported that there was 1,308 suicides in the state of Vermont. Of these suicides, one was committed with a firearm that was purchased within 24 hours. This should show you just how ineffective a 24-hour waiting period would be to the prevention of suicide. So let's look at the real issue. Not guns, but mental health. A close friend of mine several years ago attempted to commit suicide. She was rushed to a local hospital where she was stabilized. She was kept locked in an emergency room for five days before a bed had opened up at the nearby Brattleboro Retreat. Emergency departments are no longer only for if you've broken a leg or have a gaping wound. They've become the center of where people have been forced to flock due to the inability of Vermont mental health facilities to perform at the level that they and we need. 24-hour waiting period is not going to stop this issue. Having better resources for mental health is. This is a violation of our Second Amendment rights and cannot be passed. 
You've all heard the saying, first they'll take an inch, then they'll take a mile. We cannot stand for these violations. While suicide is indeed a problem in Vermont, waiting 24 hours is not going to diminish a person's feeling of suicide. If they're committed, they'll definitely find some other way to kill themselves. As a wise Vermonter once told me, if something ain't broke, I'll fix it. And Michael Morgan to testify. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Michael Morgan from Milton. I'm a United States Air Force Academy graduate and a 38-year veteran of the United States Air Force the Vermont Air National Guard. Why are we not talking about time waiting periods on all items that contribute to suicide? In other words, how about rope, antifreeze, Queechy Gorge, bridges, vehicles? Would mothers against drunk driving endorse a waiting period on vehicle purchases that drunk people use to kill innocent people? This, like last year's S55, as many have said, is another knee-jerk reaction. Why are we not looking into mental health issues, as many have said? instead of putting in motion laws that restrict even more of our rights. That's what this is all about. 24 hours will not change a thing. If someone wants to end their life, they will do it one way or another. It will hurt the small business owners that do sell firearms legally and correctly under existing federal law. Lawmakers are using suicide in this instance to contribute to the slippery slope of firearms infringement. Law lawmakers have known that they can't change the Second Amendment, so sadly are they chipping away in this mode. Methinks something is blowing in the winds of this structure, as I've heard the opposition mention a 72-hour waiting period repeatedly. What's going on, folks? Let's not change what has worked in my beloved home state of Vermont for over 200 years. This is nonsense. Stop infringing on my rights. Thank you. And the last speaker of the night will be, I think it's Rural, Rural Peterson. That's uh, Rural Peterson. Uh, thank you for calling me. Uh, I'd just like to say that I hate coming down here because every time something like this happens, you guys chip away at the Second Amendment. And it's aggravating. I mean, law-abiding citizens should not have to go through this. I mean, number one, it's in my constitution. And number two, it's in the Bill of Rights. Why do you keep doing this? I feel sorry for a person who took their lives. I really do. I don't know the person, but I've had friends that same things happened to. I come from Philadelphia. It's not even the city of brotherly love. And on any given weekend, there's 22 murders. And those murders are committed by people who are not buying guns from gun shows and gun stores. You buy them on the streets for 50 bucks, whether they're nine millimeters or calibers or AKs, whatever. You know, criminals do not care about your gun laws. They don't, they never had, they never will. They get right out of prison and they buy guns, okay? I've seen it. I've been mugged twice at gunpoint. The only thing that saved me was my ability to run. I'm 53 years old now. I had six screws in my ankle and a torn meniscus right now. So that's not a possibility. You know? So please stop trying to change Vermont to New York. If you don't like guns, don't buy guns. I like guns. I'm not stopping you. I'm just sick of a certain amount of elitist people telling the rest of us what to do. I have one favorite ask. Learn four words. Shall not be infringed. We were going to have one more, but um, I guess that's going to conclude our evening.